Good morning and welcome to this COVID-19 media briefing with some of our leading public health officials. Uh, this morning we have with us this country's Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. the Most Honorable Kenneth George, and he is uh, supported by the head, the director of the Bas Dos Santos uh, Public Laboratory, Dr. the Most Honorable Sanji Beckles. We also have with us the head of the COVID Monitoring Unit, Mr. Ronald Chapman. And let me at the outset congratulate all three of them on their national awards for the outstanding work which they have been doing in this country in the fight against COVID-19. We are going to get, first of all, an update from the Chief Medical Officer. And naturally, I believe that many people in this country would want to hear, first of all, from him about the situation as it relates to Omicron, given what is happening all around us. A reminder that we are joined by members of the media and those of you in the public who want to raise questions, you can also send messages to me via WhatsApp at 256-1023. Dr. George? So good morning, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. What I'm gonna do this morning is give an update on the, the, the current COVID situation in Barbados. And then I will speak um, to the issues surrounding the Omicron new variant. As you are aware, and as the public is aware, our numbers are trending downwards, but I say so with caution. Our current indicators that we use to, to look at the activity of disease within our population indicate that within the last two to three weeks, there has been some improvement. This is with respect to our positivity rate, our cumulative seven-day and 14-day averages, and our total case counts. In addition, we also use a measure called the R-effective, which currently is at 7.76. When it is greater than one, the infection rate is getting out of hand. But why I say with caution is that within the last two weeks, we have had two very young individuals who have lost their lives. One 28-year-old and one a 22-year-old. And although these individuals did have conditions which made them be at increased risk for COVID, I believe these should not have been lives lost. The situation has put several families in Barbados in mourning. Several families are grieving at this time around the Republic and going into Christmas. And I believe that this did not need to occur. And why it didn't need to occur is that, again, the preventative measures which we have invested in and told you about over several months still needs better actions. And therefore, I am again asking individuals because of our current situation and because the likelihood of persons, particularly with comorbid conditions, are dying at a very young age, please let common sense prevail. As you are aware, and the, 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 the level of vaccination in our population who have been had two doses and have completed an entire course, if it was Johnson and Johnson, it will be one dose, is about 57% of the eligible population. The eligible population is the population 12 years and over. 
we have put several vaccines on the market we have given several options to persons and I would like to see that we aim for a minimum of 65 percent by early January of next year that is the only chance that we will have with respect to reducing community-based spread we are in still very uncertain times as you are aware there is a new variant which has several mutations and that variant was described in South Africa just under two weeks ago it was reported to the WHO on the 24th of November and on the 26th of November the WHO declared this as a virus of concern let me say up front that there are still a lot of uncertainties with respect to virulence with respect to transmissibility and with respect to the efficacies of vaccines the information we have is limited because this is a relatively new virus but what we know is that it has been spreading very quickly so just under two weeks ago we were told that there were four to six countries and to date I can report that there are about 30 countries across the globe some of those countries indeed represent our source markets for tourism and therefore we need to be vigilant we don't need to be panicked but we need to be vigilant regardless of the strain or type of virus the protective measures remain the same so I think it is a golden opportunity as there is a new virus circulating which although we don't have information on its ability to cause severe disease and death that we use this opportunity to reconsider those who have not been vaccinated it's like playing Russian roulette to date persons who have died 90% of those individuals have been unvaccinated and 10% have been vaccinated we have never told the public that the vaccinated population will not die and that just doesn't make any sense but if you were a betting man I would prefer to be on the side of the 90% because the I would be prefer to be on the side sorry of the 10 percent of persons who have been vaccinated because your likelihood of poor outcomes are very strong the other issue I would like to let the public know is that individuals who have renal disease or who are on dialysis have consistently had extremely poor outcomes and therefore it is absolutely critical that that segment of the population which as I estimate to be about 275 individuals it is critical that they be vaccinated because it they have extremely poor outcomes because renal disease is certainly a marker for a poor outcome we have the the EOC has met on several occasions we are engaging the subcommittee of cabinet which is the policy making decision making body we have opted uh, a more wait and see approach because some countries went ahead and did complete bans partial bans and we are aware of that 
but banning is um, banning of the movement of people is a method for only delaying possible transmission. It is not an absolute and good public health measure. And therefore, um, we will continuously examine the evidence. We will come to the public, letting them know we are on a heightened state of alert with respect to um, our borders. But however, our protocols have not changed to date. I am very aware that some countries within the region have gone extra miles, and that may depend on their peculiarity in their population. But the public health team will continue to give sound advice to policymakers with respect to our directions in a state of Omicron. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. George. Uh, let's come next to Dr. Sanji Beckles from the Best Dos Santos Laboratory. Uh, Dr. Beckles, what you can do for us is to give us some sense of what has been happening at that laboratory in recent times, especially in light of the fact that we went through quite a long period of having to deal with a, a surge. So where are we now? Okay, so good morning, everyone. Um, in terms of the laboratory where we're at at this point, um, we're doing quite well in terms of being able to, to handle all the samples that are coming in. We do have enough staff and enough reagent to continue doing testing um, for our national consumption. Um, what we have been seeing, um, similar to what Dr. George actually mentioned, is that we actually have quite a decrease in terms of the numbers of persons being tested. Um, in the height of the, this third wave, we were having close to 2,500 tests being performed on a daily basis. Um, currently, we are down to about almost half of that, uh, 13, between 13 and 1,500 daily. So the numbers of persons coming forward for testing um, has decreased um, a bit. Um, and I think that may be reflective in terms of what is going on nationally. Um, so therefore, there are persons, probably not many, as many persons may be sick. Or, or have a need for coming forward to be tested. Um, but we will continue to monitor that situation. And of course, the Ministry of Health and Wellness always advocates um, that persons um, continue to be tested. If you're not well, come forward and be tested. Um, if you think you've been in contact with anyone, come forward and be tested. Um, and in that way, we have a better picture of what is actually at happening in country. So that is where we are at this point. E explain how the system has worked um, in terms of whether people would volunteer to come to you or alternatively, you would go to them. So the laboratory does not actually um, do any of the swabbing itself. Persons actually utilize any of the public testing sites. So for example, they would utilize the gymnasium testing site. Um, they would also utilize um, the Queen's Park testing site. And of course, some persons also go to private providers and some of those samples come to us as well. And of course, the polyclinics who are also doing testing, such as Winston Scott Polyclinic, Branford Tate Polyclinic, um, Morris Bayer, and the other polyclinics are all involved in that process of sample collection. So I ask the question because I know there are those who have been looking at the, the testing and they say, but if you test fewer numbers, then you get a different kind of result. So that's why I asked for you to expand on that because I'm sure that that's a question which they have out there. So I'm sure um, if you really look at it in any, in any testing situation, it, it doesn't really matter for COVID in anything that you do in terms of any lab. If you're not testing, you're not going to find it. So the whole idea is to test. And the more persons you test, the more accurate picture you have of exactly what is happening on the ground with any particular disease actually, not just COVID. Um, but again, it's a voluntary process, so persons have to come forward and be tested. Okay, thank you very much. And next, let's hear from Dr. Uh, not Dr., but from Ronald Chapman, um, who is the head of the COVID monitoring unit. Uh, your message is particularly relevant at this stage because I'm sure there are those who want to get a sense of uh, exactly what kind of activity they can anticipate from the COVID monitoring unit as we move into the Christmas period. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Good morning, Barbados. Um, we are, as you know, we are going into the Christmas holidays and we would expect that Barbadians would want to have to, as normal, have their family celebrations and come together and so on. 
At this time, that is not yet permissible. We, we are looking carefully at what is going on before um, I think any further decisions are made. You would appreciate that this is a very fluid situation. However, there are a number of things that I would want to mention to the public at this point in time with reference to the holidays. Um, it is important that we spend, we recognize that the, the prevention methods for COVID are still the same. You have the pharmacological methods and the non-pharmacological methods. Uh, things like wearing your mask. The mask must be worn whether you're vaccinated or not. And that mask must be worn above the nose and below the chin, covering both the nose and the mouth. Um, we would prefer that you um, wear a mask that does not have a ventilator or, or a valve in it. Those are not recommended. A surgical mask or a very well-fitted um, cloth mask would work. Uh, good hand hygiene. These are things that we've been saying for the longest time. Ensure that you wash your hands regularly, soap and water for at least 20 seconds if you consider that they may have been contaminated. Um, you may also carry your hand sanitizer to sanitize your hands on a regular basis. These are the, 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 the foundational elements. Stay away from crowds as much as possible. Um, you want to be able to ensure that you are in areas where your ventilation is good. We have seen that with um, Delta, ventilation has become a critical issue in that it is highly transmissible. And now what we know of Omicron right now is that that is also highly transmissible. So ventilation and the ability to have fresh air coming into places is, is um, very important. So outdoor is better than indoors right now. You want to, if, if you're going to have to meet with anyone and so on. So we're not saying that you, you are unable to meet with people and so on, but just be cautious in, your, in, in the actions that we take with reference to, to meeting, in reference to our interactions with persons. Um, there are a number of things that we, we want to continue to stress where the protocols are concerned. I know that um, we have seen some persons who they will have seen some of the numbers falling and people start to take it to mean, no, it's a free for all, we can do what we want. We've, we in the COVID unit have been seeing a number of um, gatherings and we've been taking the necessary um, approaches to dealing with those gatherings, but we're asking persons at this point in time, those things are still yet not allowed. We are hoping and we are working with the Ministry of Education. We are looking at the possibility of reopening schools early next year and other issue, other things that, are, that we are working with. And this is important for the community. So we need to be able to hold it down for persons to follow the protocols, for persons to do what is right so that we can slowly and surely reopen the economy. Um, if you are traveling, you want to be able to make sure that you're fully vaccinated. Even if you're living here in Barbados, you need full, to be fully vaccinated. We have seen, as Dr. Jara said, the, that 90% of the persons who would have passed away, nine out of 10, have been unvaccinated. Uh, um, we've seen that we, we so this is a, a, a clear indication that vaccines work get those persons vaccinated. We have an effort on right now so we can identify a lot of the older persons in the communities who are unvaccinated and see if we can get those persons vaccinated because the age range of those persons who are dying are, are we, you can see that they are elderly. Those persons who have what we call institutional knowledge, national knowledge, the wisdom of the country. And it's not good for us to lose those people. So. My, my message here is over the Christmas holidays, please, it, does not, it is not worth it to break the directive or to break the law so that you can have a family function or to go to a party or something like that and put yourself and others at risk and reverse the gains that we are steadily making within the country. Stay strong, let us stay on course. Let us steer the course where we are on so that we can continue to bring this disease under control. Mr. Chairman, how would you say that your approach to enforcement has changed over the past months? 
I would think that we have a more um, informed way of dealing with issues. In the early stages, we were, we were unsure of what we were dealing with in terms of COVID. We knew, we know a lot more now. And as we know a lot more now, we have been able to put other methods in place in terms of enforcement. Um, in the past, we were, we, we inch, and, and the other thing is, I should also say, is that the directors have changed significantly over the, the past few years as we learn more. Um, we are still as, as, as vigilant as ever. However, the protocols do allow for some, some um, easing uh, in terms of movement and activities and so on. So it is, it is important that we, we are tempered in our approach, I would want to say that. And there's one other thing I want to say, um, David, and one of the things that we are concerned about in the unit is that over the Christmas holidays, persons may not want to come forward to get tested um, because they might not want to be in isolation for the Christmas holidays. But this is, uh, this is not a, a good way of looking at the whole process of seeking care. If you are feeling signs and symptoms of COVID, please come forward to be tested. Please come forward for care. I'm not a medical doctor, but the, the doctors will tell you that COVID has a way of reducing the amount of oxygen in your blood. And you, sometimes you're not even know, you don't even know that this is happening. If you do not come forward for care, come forward for testing, it may, it may lead to a negative outcome or extremely severe disease. This is not a time for us to, to put Christmas over our own health. I think that's... Thank you. Thank you very much, Will. At this stage, I'm going to invite questions from the media and from the public. Uh, members of the public can WhatsApp their questions to us here at this number, 256. One zero two three. Uh, let's go to the media for first, though. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, hi. Yes, good, good morning. morning to everyone. Um, before I begin, let me just congratulate. Uh, His Excellency Dr. George and his team on being celebrated uh, in this island's honors. Um, Dr. George, you spoke of us not looking to panic and, you know, just take it easy. But that's a little difficult when we see that countries five times our size are already closing in um, their borders. The question for me is, in terms of, I know you said we're on a wait and see, but I'm just wondering where are we at and how soon will we know about uh, changes necessary to deal with the Omicron variant? So, let me clarify. I at no time try to trivialize Omicron. It is uh, I indicated in my submission that on the 26th, WHO indicated this was a variant of concern, and we take our lead from the WHO. The issue that we face is to make decisions regarding closure of borders or restriction of travel. And as I have indicated, that measure is not necessarily based in public health science. The closure of the borders is a temporary measure. Let us look back and see what took place with the Delta variant. And we are here today. What we need to do is have enhanced surveillance making sure that the countries that have been identified as countries that have potential risks are the countries that we concentrate on. The EOC in, his, in its judgment uses formula to decide based on the levels 
of variants within a particular population as to the, um, the, the direction we go. For Barbados, as I have indicated also, our main threat is from our source markets. And therefore, we are monitoring that situation. We are well aware that the United States indicated they had their first case in California. But does that mean that we need to, to make drastic changes with respect to our protocols? I believe that we need to be steady. We need to understand the issues surrounding this new variant and make decisions in a purposeful manner, not in a rushed manner. And this is how Barbados has managed the situation for COVID. Please recall, it was only a year ago when we, the bus crawl was in the news and that this started the wave which caused extreme concern. And why? It, 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 it redounds to behavioral issues. The spread of viruses, regardless of if it is new or re-emerging viruses, is based on behavioral issues within the population. And therefore, the gist of this press conference is to first let Barbadians know that we have a pulse of the situation, and secondly, to make sure that these, in these uncertain times, they protect themselves. We are aware, as I said, that some countries have gone extra miles. I fortunately had a meeting, a, a meeting of regional CMOs yesterday, and those countries gave um, the indication that their specific situation did warrant that. So each individual country has probably a specific reason, whether they have a large population from African countries or there's a lot of movement of visitors from that area. So that is what I would like to see on the matter. Um, it's an evolving situation. And um, fortunately, what we know is that it appears that the virus is quite transmissible, quite infectious, but not as deadly or lethal as we thought it was initially. But we are only a few days into um, understanding the ramifications. And certainly, we will continue to keep our eye on the pulse of what is happening internationally. Barbados, is, Barbados cannot, if we are part of a global village of countries, you couldn't ever feel that we were immune to the Delta. And similarly, if we are part of a global community, we, we should not get the feeling that we are immune to Omicron. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a follow-up question, Wendy? It is pertaining to the lab. Uh, so this question would be for Dr. Beckles. In relation to the actual testing. I recently spoke with a virologist about testing uh, for the Omicron variant and how we could seek to fast track that. And he suggested using the usual PCR, but adding something extra at the lab. He said he had some discussions with you about it earlier in the year. I'm just wondering if with the new variant in, how are you looking to alter procedures at the lab to be able to detect easily because we know sending to car for takes some time what are we doing to be able to detect on our own at a more rapid rate um, thanks for your question um, so really it will not really alter what we were doing currently at the at the lab or what will happen is we will add some additional testing um, to the lab so we do have some specific primers that look for what they call the s gene dropout or the gene, the S gene failure of this particular new variant. 
Um, we do have reagents in, in stock in the laboratory that we can look for that particular um, dropout gene um, for our testing. And that can be used as a proxy um, to determine if Omicron may be here. Mind you, that gene is also associated with the variant out of the UK. Um, so what you would have to do also is, is verify, first of all, um, or confirm whether is it actually the variant um, from the UK or is it really the new variant. Um, but that same particular test will look for that, that, that S gene dropout. And so we can use that if we can definitively say it's not the UK variant, then we can say it's a proxy to it being the Omicron variant and then send off samples for further testing for confirmation via sequencing. Is there another Thank question? You. Thank you very much. This person says, in light of what Mr. Chapman said, some government officers, and they name one in particular, is still insisting that all officers come to work on a daily basis. Departments with 17 plus people come to work every day. Why are some government officers still not putting adequate measures in place to safeguard their staff? Uh, let me add that there were numerous cases of COVID in this particular office. How do you respond to that? Because it, it goes in the direction of one law for Medes and another law for the Persians. That's how some people see mm -hmm. the way it operates. Sometimes I, I can understand the question. Thank you for the question. Um, I can understand the position that the person is, is asking about. What has happened is that the, there is a recommendation that if you can have persons rotate within the office to minimize the number of persons within the office, we highly recommend that you do so. The other issue that you have to con be concerned with is whether or not this is the, the, the necessity for persons to be in the office. Now, if this is one of those departments where um, each person in the department is necessary for the daily activities, then there is not a lot you can do about that. Or if it is one of those jobs where persons cannot work from home or unable to do so efficiently, this is also an issue that, that needs to be um, considered. So it is not always that you can say a particular supervisor or management does not want persons to work from home or does not want to rotate them. It, you have to first ex establish the, the landscape. Is this something that can be done from home? If it can be done from home, can it be done from home efficiently? Is this something that can only be done within the office? And at the other end, if this is something that can be done from home, and you're sure that this can be done from home, and we know that there aren't any underlying, other underlying issues, it may be possible to give the COVID unit a call, and we can come in and have a conversation and see how we can we can make things a bit more safer for the staff and for pers and for the general public who are being served by this office. Thank you. Is there another question from the media? Yes, um, Kobe Brooms from Barbados today. I have a question for the chief medical officer. Um, we've seen that the number of tests, as Dr. Beckles would have alluded to, has come down by almost half. Is there a particular reason for this? And is government at all concerned that less people are coming forward for testing? So the reasoning behind um, the drop off of in testing, I think, is twofold. With decreasing numbers, there will be decreasing contacts. If your numbers are getting a bit better, the number of contacts will decrease. And therefore, we still practice contact tracing in Barbados. It has changed a bit, yes, but we still do. So therefore, if an office was exposed, the close contacts of that office are tested. Some of them may be tested twice. Some of them may be tested on a single occasion based on their exposure. The other reason why um, the numbers have gone down is Ronald alluded to that, that we have to continue as a ministry to encourage the average man in the street to understand that testing, I've been tested two or three or four times, is not an onerous procedure. 
but it gives information on your status. And therefore, we have to be constantly at it that if you are unwell, regardless of your symptoms, you come to be tested. And that message needs to be forthcoming all the time. We have to always look at ways to make sure that testing is offered to the population. We have increased, we have a new testing site at the steel shed and we are looking to have another site open soon. And why this is the case is that we believe that community-based testing is still absolutely relevant in a COVID environment. I hope that answers your question. Does it? it yeah, yes, it does at this point in time. I have another question this time for the head of the COVID-19 monitoring unit, Mr. Chapman. Um, this question is more so um, for the point that you made about um, restrictions for Christmas activities. Um, government just had a big independent republic transition independent celebration. Um, they were open at outdoor activities. The curfew was lifted for one night only, which was um, spurred some conversation among the population about events being held. Some people have even started to advertise for Boxing Day events. Is the COVID-19 monitoring unit looking at lifting any restrictions to allow for events anytime soon? Um, and if so, um, what, what will promoters or agents be expected to do? Sorry, my mic was off. First, let me say that the lifting of um, any changes of any of the directives is a policy decision. Um, we will recommend, but that is a policy decision, and I am not able to speak on behalf of the policymakers at this time. With respect to the activities for the Republic Day celebration, there were we utilized a number of different protocols to ensure that those events were safe. Um, for example, we made sure that persons who were a part of that event were, were vaccinated. Um, that was the foundation of, the, of the, the, the protocols. The other one was for those persons that you had to be tested the day before the, the actual activity that you were involved in. So the idea was that if you're going to bring persons together in, for a mass gathering such as that one, and you still had to make sure that you had your uh, fundamentals in place. The other one of the things that you would have seen is that persons who, who unless they absolutely had to, persons would have had to wear, wear a mask during the process. Um, this, the, it was relaxed because obviously we would have tested persons prior and persons also were vaccinated. So will this be something that we're looking at in the future? Yes, it is. We are looking at it right now. Um, when will it be implemented? I am not sure. I am hopeful that we can, we can have discussions on it and see what we can do during the Christmas process. At least that is my, as a pers uh, my, my personal um, hope. However, as I said, this is a policy decision and it is one that has to be weighed not only in conjunction with what the public wants, but in terms of what is happening in terms of the public health landscape. Are the cases continually falling? Are the other metrics looking good for us to be able to say this is an acceptable risk to take um, um, and allow it, allow it across the entire, the entire um, landscape of Barbados? And that that has to be weighed in the balance. Dr. George? Yes, just let me add that you may be aware that we are going to be having um, test matches, um, T20 uh, matches. England will be here in Barbados in January. I am confident that we can have a safe space. But persons need to know that if you're going to say that a place is relatively safe and the likelihood of transmission has been reduced, the day will have to comply with the directives given. On the, in the first instance, persons will need to be vaccinated 
and in the second instance if they are not vaccinated they have to be tested to enter that space i'm quite serious so if we're going to have gatherings and i was happy to be at the event on um, Tuesday. Why? Because it was an atmosphere of celebration and I said this, you know, is something that Barbados should be striving towards. We must do it within the framework of COVID though. So the Ministry of Health highly supports this movement in this direction. I would like to compliment the, the team from the Ministry of Health that worked in the background on several of those events to make sure that they were relatively safe from the CHLOs who work in communities across Barbados. They were out in force. We had our public health nurses out in force doing managing the vaccine certification process and some of the medical officers of health who assisted with the testing of individuals. So, this was a good run, it came off well, and I'm certain that we can have many such events, providing that the public complies. This person uh, is saying here that since Omicron is among us, and the first case from California was indeed vaccinated, are we going to require that passengers coming to Barbados, or travelers coming to Barbados, are uh, regardless of their vaccination status, that those people should be quarantined. David, we spoke about this before. These are policy decisions. Um, the, the EOC is the, the body that examines the evidence and makes recommendations. And I will not like to get ahead of the game by making any pronouncement in this area but all options will be looked at. And this other question that they posed was the curfew has been extended and many businesses are opening later. How has that affected the manpower that is needed in the COVID unit to carry out its duties? Well, thank you for the question. Um, it, in terms of manpower, we have the numbers to be able to visit the places. Um, for the most part, I must say, our findings and our visits is that a lot of these places are very compliant. And they understand they've been closed for a while. This is now an opportunity to reopen. And per a lot of these businesses are not taking any chances. We are out there. We are doing our, our, um, our investigations. And we are finding a lot of, com there, there's still a lot of compliance. Let me say this, our major challenge has not been within businesses in Barbados. In fact, I would, I would, I would make the argument that businesses have been able to protect Barbadians in that when you go into a business, you're sanitized, your temperature is taken, there's a, there, there are persons who ensure that the protocols are enforced. The challenge comes when persons move outside of those structured environments. And we are seeing that, we are seeing that in the homes where persons allow, uh, where there are people who come over and visit, uh, people that you know and trust, not knowing that they may have COVID. We are seeing that on the way to and from the workplace where persons may share vehicles, they may um, stand up under the tree and have a conversation afterwards or go and have a drink somewhere together. So the business places have not been that great a uh, point of concern in terms of the transmission of COVID. Yes, we have seen COVID being transmitted in some workplaces. And when you look at those places, we would have seen a fall off in protocols at some point or the other. And this is not, um, this is as not as widespread as it used to be in the past. So we are seeing lots of compliance by businesses. However, we are still very concerned about what is going on outside of those structured environments, David. Thank you. Let's take another question from the media. Well, just to follow on um, from what the Chief Medical Officer would have said, in terms now of um, saying that the numbers are trending downward and we are seeing improvement, 
it, it, are any conversations happening about further um, lifting the restrictions, um, similar to the curfew, moving from 12 to no curfew at all? And I know that before there were some discussions about having events with people being tested before and so on. Um, will that idea be dusted off and, and, and come back on the table as think, we go forward into Christmas think those, and New Year's? I think that uh, that falls within the realm of what is uh, referred to as policy decisions, though. And um, Dr. George has already pointed out that uh, he cannot venture into that particular area because uh, at another level, decisions are being taken on those matters. So I think that is well understood. But in, in the meantime, Dr. George, though, uh, given the changes that you have alluded to in terms of the number of cases and the number of people that are being tested, uh, how much can you tell us about its implications for the use of the facilities, especially the schools, uh, so that uh, we can get some sense of what is going to happen, happen there, what is already happening, given the fact that there is this push to return to school as early as possible? So working in the COVID environment has taught me and the, the Ministry of Health team so many things. We have formed strong relationships with tourism. We have good relationships with the Ministry of Education. And certainly, we have good relationships with the private sector in Barbados. This has been indeed an experience. And <laughs> I smile because the intention of education, the Ministry of Education, is to make sure that at some stage there is return to face-to-face -face classes in Barbados. They continue to work with the Ministry of Health and we give some direction with respect to this. As you are aware, we currently have only two school-based facilities that are operational as isolation centers. That is the Lestevon School, and I think that is Queen's College. And we are trying to wind down operations at Lestevon. Um, sorry, Queen's College has been wound down. We are trying to wind down the operations at Lestevon with a view then to seeing what are the, the potential areas that other schools may be involved. So the two schools that are operational at the moment are Lestevon and Blackman and Gollum. And we are working to, by a, a staggered approach and by a slow approach, make sure that those schools are returned to the Ministry of Education once the situation permits. The, that, the, using the facilities of schools has been really a good move because it gave us the opportunity to expand to allow persons who are not as critical to be managed in those environments. But we also realize that this cannot be a long-term um, plan and the intention is to slowly return schools to the Ministry of Education in a fairly timely manner. Thank you. What do you see as some of the significant lessons that we have learned over this period? And I believe that's a question that's relevant to all three of the panelists. But I'll begin with you, um, Dr. George. The lessons learned for me is the difficulty in moving public opinion. It's so challenging. Um, we use various media, we use various messaging, and we try to come to the public giving information, and as I have always indicated, giving truthful information. The challenge I've had with the pandemic is the reluctance on certain members of the population to heed what I term to be good public health advice. And um, that is our greatest challenge. I was fortunate to engage the CMO of the Cayman Islands, and they indicated the willingness of their population to move to a better place. 
they are between 80 to 85 percent vaccinated and if you look at some countries they have done extremely well but i guess in barbados we have to use different methods but we will continue to um, to try to engage the public and that is the challenge within the ministry of health that in addition to dealing with education tourism and so forth we we struggle at times to to get the public in a better place and in retrospect i think that is fairly unfortunate because the ministry of health needs the public as a critical and integral partner i can't do it alone mr chapman and his team can't do it alone and sanji can't do it alone so um that is how i have seen the 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 inability for a, a countrywide approach with respect to 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 managing this pandemic but we will continue um david has some David um, Ellis has some ideas with respect to, again, engaging specific, ta specific targeted groups so that we can get the message across. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Beckles, from, from the point of view of testing, what do you see as the, the main lessons, especially through this surge, this Delta surge that we've, we've been dealing with? So, so really, um, thanks, David. In terms of what we have learned and, and how we will continue to, to do business at the lab, is that I think ideally we just need to be prepared for uh, anything. Um, one of the challenges that we have had um, from early in the year, as you know, the issues of, of procurement in terms of sourcing materials for testing, um, and what we have done um, since we had issues in January is always try to stay ahead of the game. Um, so we've ordered well in advance so that we don't have the shortages that we had in January so that we are always on top and we are always monitoring to make sure um, that we have a certain level of stock in the lab. But I think what is, what is critically important for us as well um, and what the Ministry of Health and Wellness has, has supported us with is having enough staff so that we are able to operate 24 hours um, a day. So we are still operating 24 hours. So at any point in time that we do have a surge, we have the manpower available that we can that we can respond as quickly as possible and i think that is really the the, the key to us being able to to detect and and um and test and get results out as timely as possible of course things happen sometimes that you have no control of i mean that's the nature of life in anything that you do but we always try our best to stay on top of everything and have all systems available to keep us operating at our optimum this question uh, says that they want to get some clarity on approval of home isolation and they wanted to know whether all properties are now approved for isolation this seems to be a gray area writes the person that is a big concern especially in the tourism sector can you shed any light on that mr chapman thank you for the question um as you would appreciate when our cases um first began we were able to isolate persons and remove them from the community so that we could restrict the movement of the disease through our in, through our country uh, as things progressed um, we would have seen at the point of delta the large number of cases so we had to move the, the the system could not handle the amount of cases that we were getting so it was necessary for us to put persons into home isolation and uh, assess them and monitor them from there uh, this, process, this also has been extended to the hotels as well. There are some hotels that are not interested in having persons isolate there, and then there are some hotels which, by misadventure, they would have had someone come in, and that person became or showed positive while they're here in Barbados. Now, you can't obviously... Uh, move them out and, and, and put them somewhere else. So you had they, they, they would have had to be there and the Ministry of Health would have worked with those hotels to ensure that all protocols with reference to positive persons were met. So if there are any persons who are unsure as to whether or not they, they, they have permission to isolate persons at their hotels, they can give us a call. Now there's another thing that, and I think this is more germane to the question, there were some hotels which were designated isolation hotels. Now, 
these were these the for for you to have to, let's say you, you, instead of just having the odd person who is isolating at the hotels these were hotels where we were where we were person placing a number of persons who were who were um, infected with covid now for that to happen where you have an, that that high number of persons then you would appreciate that the risk to staff and other persons within that hotel increases so the ministry of health would have otherwise go in and we would have done our due diligence to ensure that a number of measures would have been put in place to, to, to safeguard those persons who were isolating and also to is safeguard the staff, both medical and non-medical, as well as ancillary staff at the property. Well, as we approach Christmas, you know, there are a lot of people who are going to be gathering, family gatherings and uh, mm -hmm. among friends. And this question is relevant to that exercise. Can I have a family luncheon if all persons are fully vaccinated and I administer rapid testing? Um, that, 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 that is a, a, a very, that, that's a very, very good question. The answer to that right now is, I, I, according to the, the, the directive that is, that is that is relevant right now? The answer to that is no right now. In short, will that change? I do not know. Um, as I said before, it is, it is, there are a number of things that are being considered right now, and it would be premature for me to make a pronouncement because as that is also a policy decision whether um, we are going to relax the protocols for the purpose of family gatherings and so on because the family gathering and, and the definition of party under the law can be quite blurred. So while one group may decide to have a couple persons over for um, lunch, you may have a large number of persons, like at my house usually on Christmas, where there are lots of them and, they, and there's lots of laughter, talking, music playing and so on, and then um, there they may some, be some relaxation of protocol. So I would want to say that give us some time. We are working on it. And we, I'm sure that in a short space of time, something will be said concerning what is going to happen over the Christmas holidays. And just remember, a lot of this is going to be dependent upon what is happening epidemiologically within the country. So if we have persons going out there breaking protocols and, there's, and the, the cases start to go back up, then obviously, as the Prime Minister would say, the breaks go back on. But if we do what we're supposed to do, then there can be an easing of the brakes and the pressing of the accelerator. What exactly does the protocol say, uh, the directive say right now, in relation to gatherings of that nature? Basically, the protocols do not allow for parties, graduation, banquets, balls, those sort of things. And it does allow for persons to, um, I, I, if my memory serves me correctly, um, what people would call a line. So you don't want to completely res restrict persons um, all together. However, the issue comes with whether you're indoors or outdoors. And the issue has to do with the, 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 the method of the, the way we gather and so on. So it is, it is a lot of the times um, falls within its subjective in terms of how people see the law, not how the law is written, but how people see the law. So what we, we like to do is tell persons, if you're not sure, give us a call. Because we've had instances where persons had gatherings at their home, and they're saying, well, hey, this, this is a line. But the, the, the challenge is that once you start to go into homes and so on, there is crowding, there is restriction of airflow. There are those um, risk factors which place which place people at higher levels of risk. So there are lots of different nuances and it is better for persons to give us a call so that we can guide them accordingly. Well, that brings me back to you, uh, Dr. Caleb George. This whole question of the science, because at the end of the day, what happens over the Christmas period and all like now, because this is it. This is the period where people really get together and Christmas day is usually a family day. So when it comes to where we are right now with Delta, the uncertainty with respect to Omicron, uh, what are your thoughts on how 
people in the in the community should proceed at this stage yes um i think we can still have a very enjoyable um, christmas holiday and new year it must be tempered with the um with the understanding that we are still in uncertain times and in a pandemic which has caught the globe by surprise. Actually, um, I was fortunate to attend a special session of the United Nations because the there's a feeling globally that we need to be able to respond more timely and more forcefully when this event is over and when there are future pandemics. So um, this is the way the landscape of public health has been. We have seen new emerging viruses. Please recall we recently experienced chikungunya in Barbados and um, we, we experienced um, more standard forms of vector-borne disease such as um, dengue fever. We went through a Zika outbreak. The changing landscape with respect to um, new and emerging diseases will be with us for a period of time. We need to live with it. We as a population can live with it but I'm asking that you follow the basic guidance of the public health teams to make sure that we can get through this also. Do we have any other questions from the media? One question for me, David. Is there any update on the Safe Zones Initiative? So all I will say on that matter is that the the intent was to have safe zones at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, district hospitals, and the psychiatric hospitals. And we have had several meetings. And as far as I'm aware, the teams are up and running. And they are working towards making this a reality. Please recall that the safe zones, although they are up and running. It will take time for all the staff, etc., to be validated with their vaccines and to be tested. But I just would like to let you know that um, we have had full cooperation from the geriatric hospital, psychiatric hospital. QEH has done tremendous work. And um, the other area is the nursing homes and senior citizens' homes in the private sector. So they have been working quietly behind the scenes to make sure that this policy directive comes to fruition. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much. And uh, to those of you who have sent us questions and to those of you who, who have posed questions from the media, uh, I also want to thank our panel today, made up of uh, Mr. Ronald Chapman, who is the head of the COVID monitoring unit the director of the Best Dos Santos Laboratory, Dr. the Most Honorable Sanji Beckles, and the Chief Medical Officer of Health in Barbados, Dr. the Most Honorable Kenneth George. I'm David Ellis. Do have a great afternoon.